Good morning. Today is Thursday, December 7th, 2023. Today I want to discuss a tragic, agonizing subject for the purpose of learning about a new way to apply ancient, classic Jewish law. So the Hebrew word aguna, which literally means anchor, like a ship has an anchor. So the form for a woman feminine is aguna, for a man agun. It refers to a person who is trapped in a marriage, anchored in a marriage that is not viable, with no way to end it in Jewish law. Now today, We mostly use this term when there is a recalcitrant spouse who refuses, because of anger or spite or some other malicious reason, to refuses to cooperate in a get, a Jewish divorce. The only way a Jewish marriage can end according to Jewish law as long as both of the spouses are living. But The classic case, that case is not actually discussed in the Talmud. The classic case of Aguna, which is discussed in the Talmud, which blessedly is less common today, is when, for example, a husband leaves home and is never found. He's never heard from again. He may have died, in which case his estate transfers to his heirs, His family mourns his passing, and his wife, who is now a widow, is now unmarried and free if she wishes to remarry. Or, since we don't know, he may be alive and doesn't return or contact his family for any number of reasons. And in that case, his property remains his, There is no mourning because there is no death, and his wife remains married to him. Now, in this situation of doubt, Jewish law does not provide any amount of time to pass in order to declare him deceased. As long as there is a doubt, even the slightest doubt, his wife must assume he may be alive, and she is an aguna, anchored, chained to a status of limbo without her husband and unable to remarry. It is a terrible tragedy. So the rabbis went to great lengths to mitigate this terrible problem by lowering the standards of evidence and witnesses from what would be requested, required in Jewish law in some other comparable criminal law case. Now, in modern times, this has been extended by authorities in Jewish law to such evidence as fingerprints and DNA evidence, as long as it is proof positive of death and not just a very likely probability. In the aftermath of 9-11, some Jewish men were declared deceased on the basis of phone calls they made in their last moments, locating them in the parts of the World Trade Center from which there were no survivors, Nebuch. The barbaric attack by Hamas on October 7th, beyond the horror and anguish and outrage and grief that is still growing, has also led to a new development in Jewish law. At least it's new to me. Last Friday... December 1st, Israel and the Jewish people received terrible news that seven Israelis who had been deemed hostages in Gaza were officially declared deceased and their families were informed. 
And this was done with the involvement and approval of Israel's chief rabbis, without their bodies being returned, without any witnesses to their death, and without any forensic witnesses. Their deaths were determined without witnesses, without forensic witnesses, without forensic evidence, using unconventional means, photos, and video clips, along with intelligence information. To my knowledge, this is the first time that this type of evidence has ever been utilized by Jewish law in this way. And these videos were filmed inside Israel by security cameras, by some of the victims, or from videos that Hamas itself posted on social media from Israel and then later from Gaza. The committee doing this work convenes, watches the clips repeatedly, analyzes them, compares them to photos before and after, and also uses supporting evidence and intelligence information to reach their conclusions. The committee has said that determining death is really such a sensitive and sacred issue. Remember from what we said earlier of how much rides on this, that there's no option of making mistakes And therefore, they say, at no point was death determined on the basis of a single video clip. It had to be reinforced and repeated and evidenced from multiple sources. The head of the committee is Dr. Hagar Mizrahi. And she said, in all the cases in which we determine death, It was the unanimous opinion of all the committee members, and even if there was the slightest doubt, we did not decide. Professor Omer Marin is a member of this committee, and he wrote, I've been on the committee for over a month already, and despite the complexity, I feel personal and national pride and sacred activity in what we are doing here. We all approach it with great respect out of an intention to try as much as we can to identify evidence of even the smallest signs of life of the hostages. That's the most important objective. But we also know that it's so important to the families to receive the information, even if it is the worst, about their dear ones and to eliminate the doubts. And the committee works together with Chief Rabbi, Chief Sephardi Rabbi Yitzchak Yosef. He and his team review all of the materials used to determine death and give the final rabbinical approval, which is necessary for families for the reasons that I mentioned before, especially for the wives, now the widows, to know at least that they are not an aguna, but Nebuch, God forbid, they are widows. Because, as I said before, there must be proof positive of death in order for a woman to be able to remarry. And according to this newly established Jewish law, this video evidence, together with intelligence evidence, the way that it's being done, meets the standard of proof positive of death according to the highest levels of Jewish law. This is just one example of the way Jewish law advances with new technology. And it's also an example of holiness in the midst of horror. My friends, I wish you a good day, and I look forward to seeing you soon in person.